Did you want to include Rick in this? Yeah. Okay, let me call him up. Okay. I think he sent you an invitation. Okay. Add. I am not that. Uh, not so well versed in stuff. Okay, but I think the call went out. There he is. Great. All right. I reckon yours? Yep, to be fine. Thanks. Oh, great. We haven't a video yet, but I can hear you. That's okay. I just want to be able to watch you guys. Okay, great. <laughs> he wants to make sure that things are still that are working on this end, that uh, the light is okay and whatever. So yeah, it looks great. Okay. Yeah, everything oh, right. looks fine. Okay. Um, but actually, before we do that, the uh, we're yeah we're the uh, Boston Horror Readers. Um, we're part of a larger Boston Horror Society. Uh, we've got like seven hundred people uh, members in this side with the. Uh, I think the society does mostly movies and conventions and things like that, but the uh, but the book club's kind of part of that, and we're um, yeah, we, we're uh, really psyched to be talking to authors. Well, this is a good way to be able to do it too. Oh, there we go. Okay. If that was your uh, okay. Well, let's go back to the final. Yes. Yes. <laughs> let's, talk, let's talk about it. Let's talk about it, because, uh, yeah, it's, it's just, I just no, go ahead. ahead. No, 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 no. Yeah, I, just, I remember the first time I read it, like, it was probably 10 years ago, and it really struck, it, it was a little, I was a little more uncomfortable with it back then, just because it reminded me uh, so much of a lot of people I knew at the time. Just so kind of. All right. Thank you. Uh, so well, All right. Thank you. Anyway, yeah, just a lot of people that I that I went to high school with and um, just had that. I, don't, I can't imagine it's like a fairly generational kind of. Mentality. Yeah, I definitely recognize okay. <laughs> people in there. So it's definitely not just Generation X, but just did it the, seem like a particular setting, or because I've had people from all over tell me they know where this book was set. Really? I, I oh, yeah. assume it's Detroit, but I don't. Um, I'm not sure. I thought it was New York. I don't remember. Was, was there a spe specified place? I don't remember if it was. There I don't think not. it was. Yeah. I didn't find one. All right. It was like people going to try to find the, uh, the house of leaves there in Virginia. Or yeah. <laughs> the fictitious place. Right, and I think I think that's part of why it feels specific to a lot of people because it is not a specific place, so you can right. make it be anywhere you want. That was just curious. I mean, is this? It's probably the first question you get. But is it? Are the? Is are Nicholas and Lakota and people like that based on people you knew or know? Okay. It could easily be play, be uh, about people that I knew. <laughs> yeah. No, I don't. I don't necessarily. I don't like work from life like that. The characters. I think them before I start writing, but they're never based on the only book that I've ever based on actual person was this novel, Christopher Wilde, that is about oh, right. Christopher Marlowe, the playwright, right? <laughs> That's uh and yeah, I guess you didn't know him personally. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I heard you're a big fan. Um yeah. Um but yeah, like I say, when I read it, it was just, it actually made me really uncomfortable how much it reminded me of these people from high school. Just how, just how kind of, um, kind of 
you know, disenabled, I guess, or just sort of, they just had no, I mean, they were just so um, at a loss for how to to do anything, to help themselves, to just, like, they just wanted the world to leave them alone, um, and yet they still wanted to interact with it, um, and that was, yeah, it was just, it was Nicholas to a T. Yeah. Just sort of, just sort of how much of a, just kind of, I mean, I assume he was clinically depressed, but obviously never, uh, didn't seem like he was seeking any treatment for that. And, and it's interesting for me to look at the book again, um, Meerkat Press, which you may know, is bringing out a new edition next year. Okay, was the actual print edition, not just the uh, ebook? Yeah, a print, okay. an English, oh, right. a print edition in English next year, and um, coinciding with a uh, new story collection of mine mm -hmm. called Velocities. So they will both be out. One's out in April, and I think the other one's out in August. Okay. So it's inter and it was interesting for me to look back on those characters, and I see them differently than I did, you know, obviously when I first wrote the book. Right. Now I, I can see different aspects of them that I probably couldn't see the first time around. Okay. Is there a new forward to the new edition that uh, you're sort of reflecting on it? Um, I did a forward for the ebook version, okay. but I don't believe I'm going to be doing one for this. I don't know if she is going to want to ask, invite someone else to do it. That I don't know. Okay. Yeah, I was pretty shocked to find that it was out of print. Mm. We actually decided to do this book yeah. before I realized that it was basically ebook only or paid. 70 bucks for a uh for an oh, yeah. or see if you can find it in the library. well i have been invited a lot through the years for to do a reprint of it but i really wanted it to be someone um someone who i felt was sympathetical with the book and who would do a really good job and make a great object out of it as well as back into print and trisha reeks who does if you don't know meerkat press she has a really interesting list, and I'm really excited to be doing stuff with her. Hmm. Uh, is it is it hardcover or soft cover? Um, I believe we're doing soft cover. Actually, okay. I can't imagine the cipher as a hardcover. <laughs> I just really can't. I mean, I have had that offer throughout the years, and they have like a deluxe edition and whatever. Right. That doesn't really seem super cipher-y to me, so. <laughs> <laughs> I can see that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I can see that. Um, so the as far as as far as something also get a lot is about what's in the fun hole. Um, is it how fleshed out do you have in your mind about that, with the world down there? What it consists of, or who's there, or what it wants, or what it's doing. I think that's what makes the the whole concept interesting is that everyone is going to have a different interpretation of what's down there, and it's pretty unknowable. I think. I mean, if if people are, it's it's the trope, right? It's the one big thing. It's great. It's death. It's the big hole that we don't know what it is. We come out of it. We go into it. We don't know. My concepts. Or what would unnerve me or disturb me would be different from yours or from someone else's. So I wouldn't. I couldn't presume to say what would be down there for anyone. It's like saying, "What does the monster in your closet look like?" Everybody going to have a different monster. Right. I think it's better not having a specific concrete idea for what is in the fun hole, just because that does make it scarier. And I think that definitely the characters perceive the fun hole being different and I think that when they, they're watching the videotape I think they all see different things right. I think too that I really like the idea of history not being updated and it would be a completely different story if it was set now because I mean obviously they'd be live streaming it right it would right, be yeah. completely different and using, you know, the old school technology that was available to them at the time with no money and 
having to do it that way produces a completely different artifact than if, you know, Dakota was aiming her phone at the funnel. Well, um, and it was, I mean, I guess getting little glimpses just about how it's affecting Nicholas, but also having like a grinning metal skull tell you that it loves you is, uh, I guess it gives some insight just how, just how messed up it must be, or what, is, like what, what the fun hole is trying to do, or if there is any, if there is any. Right, sort of, that you don't really. It's more like I think someone in the maybe it's Nicholas says it's like a process, it's right? Like right. A thing and more a process. <laughs> it's like trying to interrogate, you know, a, a disease or you know, physics. Right. It doesn't think the way you think. It, you can't give it anything or whatever it might want from you. How would you know, right? <laughs> you, can't, you can't begin to think what it might need or want or require because you just don't think that way. Yeah, it was sort of, um, I'm trying to think. And he, he tries to get away from it, too. I liked that. I like that he tried to get away from it, but that it was sort of both the fun hole and Nakoda kind of pulling him back in and that he couldn't escape from either of those two parts of his life. And they become so intertwined as well because of Nakoda's obsession with the fun hole. And it's it's interesting to look at, I mean, to me, the one character who always made the most sense was Vanit, who was the one person who's like, I'm piecing out of here. This yeah, is crazy. she gets out. Crazy pants, man. I gotta go. Which I, I always wonder that when I watch horror movies or thriller movies or whatever, what if these people just left and said, I don't need this. I gotta go. I mean, it would kill the narrative, Dad, but... Somewhere along the line, there has to be somebody smarter to say, I'm not doing this. And that person was beneath, right? Right. She was the smart she one. She disappears, right? She just disappears from the story. She's like, I'm gone. I don't need this. And she tells, um, I think it's Randy, she tells him, don't, don't come back to me if you're still obsessed with this thing. You know, it's right. I mean, because she's right. She's the smart she, person. She's going, right to get I away from it. Literally, don't need this anymore. I mean, mm -hmm. I've gone as far as I can go with this, and I can see that this is going to go off a cliff pretty soon. And I don't want to be there when it does. Mm -hmm. I was tracking. I mean, like I said, the second time, the second time I read it, I was sort of going through and tracking, or trying to sort of get a sense of exactly what Nicholas is trying to accomplish or what's what he wants out of because he keeps going back he goes to uh i can't remember his friend's name now. Um, uh, he goes to his friend's house sort of uh Randy. what's up Randy. yeah um, it was Randy. no it, it was a uh, female nora oh yeah nora. right 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 he goes she to nora's house for a while small party yeah right I, and i kind of got it was really interesting because I got a sense from his stay there that he's really kind of rallying himself and deciding what he, um, deciding what he's going to do and how he's going to handle things. And you really got to get that kind of rocky moment because he's building himself up and he's going to go, you know, he's going to go take control of the situation. And he gets back there and just you know, overwhelms him again. And, um, but at one point, it kind of seems like sort of the, so, you know, sort of like the boxing montage moment where he's going to, like, you know, where he's really going to try to overcome things, and then he just sort of gets back and just, just gets just completely uh, taken in by, I guess, the, his addiction to the funnel. Which I... Yeah. I was at, um, I was a guest at StokerCon last mm -hmm. week. I saw that. On one of the panels, we talked about the similarities between Henry James's Turn of the Screw and Shirley Jackson's Haunting of Hill House. And one of the, the ways I suggested we could look at that was if you reread Haunting of Hill House, but you think of Eleanor as a completely malignant character, oh, wow. not like someone who is, you know, overwhelmed by this and, oh, no, but if really she's the engine driving everything, and she and, and Nicholas in a lot of ways have 
a similarity. Or if Eleanor had just left, would any of that right. have happened? Right? Yeah. If she literally just put back the stolen car and yeah. or if Nicholas had just kept going, right. would that stuff still have happened? Yeah, like I said, I was kind of like yeah. wondering the whole time, why doesn't he just keep going? What keeps him what, I mean, not just going back to his apartment, but going back to that room. Um, and God, that is really that's an interesting thing. I'd never, it never occurred to me to think of Eleanor as like anything but sort of reacting to what's going on around her. Right. Um, and I guess yeah, that's, that's a neat way to think of it. Yeah, the right. fact that maybe she's at, somehow unknowingly causing it. She, she would be so um, okay. Or even knowingly causing it. Oh, and yeah. Pull back on the stick, right? Um, and I, I think the other thing, too, is that. Um, Nicholas also keeps going back to Nakota, even though she's just not a good person for him. She, it's not a good relationship. She's way too self-centered and way too narcissistic. But he keeps going back to her. And so I think, for me, I think it's a combination of Nakota and the fun hole that he keeps going back to. Why I have a lot more, that, more charitable feelings toward her than I used to? Because <laughs> as as selfish as she is and as single-minded as she is, she also is the only one who really takes him seriously. That's true. That is true. And, I mean, to everybody else, he's just this, you know, I mean, he has almost no other human contact anyway. He's, he's right. sort of self-isolated, and she's the only thing in his life that gives it life. I mean, otherwise, yeah. he's just a dude sitting on a couch a lot, so... That is true. He may, oh. may rag on her, and she's, oh, she's so awful. I mean, she is awful, but frankly, he's no day at the beach either. No. <laughs> no, like I said, no, no, it's, no. It's, I, I mean, like I said, when I originally read it, I, I was trying really hard to like it. Because oh, yeah. the people who oh. reminded me of were <laughs> friends of mine. I like them, but don't try. I think, every, I think in every way that I tried to like them and couldn't, where were ways that you know I like my friends, but I had, you know I'm, they're problematic. <laughs> right, for sure. And I think another another example that we had talked about on that panel was um, Weather Heights. When you find out, when it dawns on you that Nellie, the narrator, could be lying her ass off. Mm -hmm. We have no idea what actually happened. We only have this one person's account is the right. only thing that, that we get to go on. So we don't know if she's whitewashing some of it. We really don't know. And when, right. you, when you figure that out, I think it was, that, that book is one of my favorite books in the world. I've read it a million times. I don't remember how old I was when I got to that point and said, wait a minute, this could all be, <laughs> you know, and it completely changes the way you read the book. When you oh. realize, I mean, yeah. we're getting all this from Nicholas's point of view, but is right. he the most reliable narrator? That's true, yeah. I can't imagine. <laughs> I mean, would you even give this guy your car keys? I mean, oh, God. Good. I wouldn't give him my phone number. No. I'm, I'm surprised that. if you have Norris house without burning the place down accidentally. Exactly. I know. So if we're really only getting it from his point of view, how true is all of this? Mm -hmm. And the fact that he, I mean, he's, he's, he tries to be sympathetic by, I mean, I guess he tries to avoid taking ownership of the situation by telling everyone to leave him alone and get out of here. And I just, you know, um, and then he winds up almost killing Malcolm and, right. uh, and killing Nicole. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I guess he kind point. of had a lot of agency in the situation all along, right? Yeah, yeah, he's he's, he's kind of telling show. us that he's, he does and he does and he does it. Mm -hmm. um, and he's, yeah, so he's, and it's just for like little bursts of violence and uh, I guess sort of any kind of effectiveness at all. Otherwise, it just, he seems like, or at least he purports to be this, this kind of, this person that just wants everyone to go away and leave him alone until he gives Nakota the orders her to move into his house or his apartment and pay rent and that sort of thing. Um, right, so, he's like, like enabling and fostering this whole thing to keep it going. I mean, 
If he, if he really wanted to do this so much, why doesn't he just go in there and don't tell anyone about it or again, just leave? Okay. He has an awful lot of agency. I think that he, in the way that he's telling us the story, it's like, oh, poor me. These terrible things are happening to me. Oh, I wish everyone would stop it. <laughs> but if he's the only one who can activate this thing, it, it, it's easy to stop. Just go away. Just don't come back. Place. Don't ever come back. Yeah. I, think, I think the thing is, is that as much as he keeps demanding that people leave him alone, he doesn't really want to be left alone. Mm. And that going through something that's weird and horrifying, but he doesn't want to go through it alone. And so he's sort of very selfishly pulling all these other people into it. Sure. And they, I mean, they could all do what Denise did too and just take That's off. True. And me alone. Yeah. So it is kind of codependent in that way. Everybody wants right. to see. And we have all been in some variant of that situation, right? Where oh, yeah. everybody wants something awful is happening, but nobody wants to be the first to leave because they kind of want to see anyway. Even though it's bad, they kind of want right. to see. And is that, I mean, is that, um, do you consider this kind of like a product? I mean, I guess it's sort of inevitably a product of its time, but um, it just has a lot of resonance for me as, uh, you know, having grow, growing up in that time. Um, just of that, of the whole Generation X, Douglas Cooper, and um, slacker kind of uh, aesthetic. It just sort of be like, a, you know, in, in you know, a lot of pessimism back then and sort of like a, sort of acting world weary went in college and that's sort of I mean, it seemed like a hallmark of that time and a lot of i i underscored a lot of your a lot of just just snippets throughout the text are just great um wandering through life with my one constant a constant shrug i mean it, it definitely seems like my experience in college and high school right and friends of mine i guess I'm, i guess that probably still happens um and but the do you get a lot of people asking you like what's it all mean? Is this a metaphor? Is like um, is the fun hole just sort of like a metaphor for addiction or that's oh, everybody thing? wants to know. I mean that, yeah, that's usually the question. And mm -hmm. I I don't have an answer. I mean anyone anyone's experience of reading that book is equally valid as far as I'm concerned. I don't I think what makes it interesting at all is that it is this mystery. It's this blank process that you can project anything onto or nothing. I mean, nothing as a concept, it's like vacuum. It's very hard to think about. Right. Think about absolute nothing. Our brains are not constructed to play with that Rubik's Cube for too long, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it may not actually be a thing. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, <laughs> so yeah. as far as as far as the you know the nihilism or the blankness, you can go back to the punks too in the seventies, right? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. were very much about especially the British version of punk, which was about mm -hmm. everything here is going to shit. Our economy is terrible. We have no money. We have this horrible person in power that we can't stand. Things look bad, and we don't know how to respond to it other than we're the blank generation, right? I mean, I'm an anti. I'm an anarchist. I'm the antichrist. Whatever. This isn't. Nothing is working out the way that we were told or led to believe or brought up to believe. Everything is is not. How do we meet that? Oh, and I guess that's kind of a that's sort of a hallmark of the millennial generation now, I, from what I've heard. I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I'm I'm technically part of the millennial generation because I fit in with one of was, but um, yeah, it kind of is. It's it's that sort of frustrating depressing you know you feel like you're railing against a brick wall that won't change right and it's kind of very easy to sort of sink into that 
like pessimism and to just sort of be like, well, screw it, you know? Right. Why should I bother? Why should right. I do anything if, and especially when you factor in climate change and go, okay, now we're really boned. Now, now we're now really, we're, now we're, now we're yeah. Um, yeah, it is. I mean, it's an easy, some people think that that's the whole idea behind the fun hole too, is that it's like the idea of despair. Like when you just throw your hands up and go, okay, I'm done. I don't get anything. Um, yeah, you definitely get a lot of that from Nicholas. <laughs> He's just like <laughs> bottomless pit of despair. Like I can say, when he was at Norris House, it kind of seemed like he was he was really kind of like getting control of that. And, um, um, yeah, it didn't amount to much, I guess. <laughs> and then you wonder, well, why didn't you just keep going? What, yeah, right. Right. Why did you come back? Why did you just, I mean, maybe that's more compelling than any escape could ever be. Right. I want to, I, because he's really been, I mean, when you have a, a giant hole in the end, somebody got to go down that thing. I mean, really, what else are you going to do with it? Right. Well, at one point, Nakota says to him, Do you want to know why you'll always be stupid? It's because you're afraid to be anything but. And I think that that kind of speaks to why he ultimately doesn't keep going when he has the way out. I think that ultimately is why he goes back to the fun hole in Nakota. It's because he's too afraid of that change and he he doesn't know what the way out will entail for him. He doesn't, it's, it's too much of an unknown. And even if it does wind up making things better, he's more comfortable with the shit that he knows, kind of. Literally the devil you know. Yeah. Right, right. Or that that this is something that's happening to him that is bigger than anything that has ever happened. And maybe he's not as stupid as he looks. Maybe he's smart enough to realize nothing in my life. I mean, even if he did, let's say he, he ran away, whatever. Right. What is going to happen to him in his life that's going to be as interesting as this? Not yeah, that's true. I don't think he's a bad person, but I think he is not considering the effect of this thing on everybody around him. Okay, or or what right. might happen if he goes in this? If this is what it's been constructed or what it's manifested to do is to get him to go in there, what is it going to be like once he does that? Mm. Has, I mean, who has anybody thought of that? That might be the, like the worst thing you could possibly do. Maybe it's Please. an accelerant. I mean, yeah, like, right. Nobody thought this thing through very well. I just don't think <laughs> it was a good idea. I think in the sense of a lot of thinking going on within that whole group, something from Dakota, who's, um, who's uh, I guess her, her sort of aim is which is curious too because i mean that that is a a real uh sense of courage from the coda to really embrace the father as i mean from what she's calling you know transcursion and what it sounds like she's actively wanting to be uh changed by this thing she really doesn't have any any way to know what's she on the other hand smart enough to realize things could go bad, very bad, in a way that no one could foresee. But yeah, she's strong enough to say, you know what? I'm ready. I want to take the plunge. <laughs> yeah. That's why, I mean, that's why she gets so frustrated with Nicholas, because it's like, this thing's given to you. Mm -hmm. You're doing nothing. What are you even doing with it? You're not doing anything with it. So, yeah, they're quite a pair, though. They, they, they're a great couple. Yeah, they, they work well together. They're very codependent, but yeah, okay. but I think that's what makes their relationship work, I guess, for lack of a better term. That's that's at least what what drives the plot. Sure, and and she's a character too that through the years people have invariably come up to me and said, "I know someone just like her," or "I used to work with someone like her," or, "I dated someone like her," or, "I married someone like her." She is universal. She is. She is someone we all know. <laughs> I know. I'm not She's sure unforgettable I know. in her own way, right? I know yeah. Nicholas. I don't know if I know Nakoda. Mm. 
Maybe I just don't know it yet. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> it's waiting for me somewhere. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, this, I don't really know. <laughs> when the funnel is telling Nicholas that it loves him, that's, that, that just blew my mind. It was just so freaky. And having, <laughs> having this metal skull whisper to him. And this, right, it's what we all yeah, want, right? Right, loved, right? So <laughs> this is the, the kind of the ultimate lure. Yeah. yeah. And we never really answer exactly why the fun hole, uh, I guess in his assessment that the fun hole wants just him. We never right. really, we never really get. Or even why it's there. Why, yeah. is, it, why is it even there? Yeah, we don't. And I think that, that makes it scarier not knowing. That it could just, it because it, it definitely opens up the idea of like, well, it, this could also happen in your apartment building. This could, this could happen to you. A, a dimension to another portal could open in your spare room and it could want you. Or something else could happen that is equally awful but completely right. different, right? It's like if this thing is true, that's what always bothers me in in horror films when people just kind of accept something awful without thinking, okay, if this is true, then everything I have ever believed about life is wrong. Like, if this right. thing can happen. I had written a story uh, called Myths and Legends that's about this girl, and she's writing a, a, she's writing a paper for school, and the, she's supposed to be writing a, a two-character two play. And the, her characters are meeting a leprechaun who is, like, going to give them three wishes. And she's thinking, what if I, like, literally met a leprechaun, wouldn't that in itself be incredibly bizarre that you'd go? Yeah. You'd, even be, you'd be like, what even is this? Why is this happening? And the more she thinks about it, the more awful it becomes. And her little two-act play gets weirder and weirder because she's thinking, well, if this thing is it actually happen and it's going to give me wishes you know then it's like monkey's paw or like right. how do I know that it, they may, it may very well be fulfilled wishes but what if I don't what if I make a mistake or what if it gives me something I say I want because it knows that that's like the wrong thing for me to have or like this whole situation is too weird I don't want anything to do with it so in the story she ends up having uh, she and the boy she likes end up taking the Leprechaun back and just letting him go free and getting no wishes. It's like I, I'm not this above my pay grade. I want to handle this. Nice. What is, what's the name of that? It's called Myths and Legends. Okay. Right. I'll have to track that down because that's. That does sound like a cool premise, though. What's and that does sound like a smart way to deal with a leprechaun. Right. You just, just let it go do its thing. Just say, no, I'm not interested. I'm good. Right. I'm good. I'll, yeah. I'm. I'm good. <laughs> You always think you're going to be able to handle things when they happen, or you believe that you, I mean, you, the generalized you, we always think we're going to be able to handle stuff. And weird things happen that not only do we not know how to handle, we don't even know how to apprehend it, right? It's like, right. what? What? Right. Um, it kind of reminds me of, I don't know, it was a commercial I saw a long time ago. I don't remember what it was for, but it's this stereotypical breakfast cereal commercial and this family sitting at the table and the mom puts the cereal box on the table and this cartoon son jumps out and starts telling the family about the cereal. And then the family's looking at this cartoon son and just starts screaming and running away. <laughs> it was oh, like, what is happening? My food started to have a one-on-one -on -one right. with me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, I'm, I don't really want that to happen. That kind of goes against everything I know to be real. Well, right. The the and if and uh, if that's true, that uh, this cartoon son can jump around and start talking to you. What else might happen? Like, what exactly. else is going to happen next? I mean, maybe the fun hole is like the least of your problems. <laughs> right. I mean, you're talking about incontrovertibly, incontrovertibly the ghosts are real. I mean, one day it just happens and yep. it just sort of opens up that whole avenue. Absolutely. And if you, again, if you buy into, 
It's yeah. not, I mean, depending what people's beliefs are, if you buy into a belief above all evidence of your uh, eyes no. or whatever and say, no, this is true. I mean, it's kind of like the opposite, right? It's like, yeah. I believe this is true and nobody can change my mind. And mm -hmm. you will do terrible things in the service of that belief rather than invalidate it, right? Rather than right. say, maybe I was wrong about flying spaghetti monster. Mm -hmm. You're like, no, it's totally true. And we're going to, I'll... Belief is a terrible engine to to start up. Once it starts, it goes on its own. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, let's see. I had a couple of couple other things here. Um, actually, just one quick question: Is transcription a rational word? It is. Okay, yeah, because I didn't, right. I looked it up, my, my phone wasn't telling me anything about uh, that, actually, I, th I thought maybe it's, I thought you mashed some words together, but I, I'm an English major, too, and I just, no, it's, it's for real, it's for real. <laughs> okay, gotcha. Um... <laughs> Oh wow, yeah, yeah. That's actually one more, one more cool uh, quote that I saw was a uh, stomach of a sharp and deliberate prod to the reanimate corpse of my zombie talent. Um, that has made me think a, a lot about my own writing. Really? Just, sort of <laughs> just that. No, for I mean, that's that's really interesting. Mm. Just feel like it was. Ah, I can't make context now, but the. Um, it was just about. Oh, here it is. Yeah, empty page is better that way. I had some ideas, had not of writing more poems. Sharp and deliberate prod to the reanimate corpse of my zombie talent. Um, <laughs> yeah, I've I've uh, I've felt that way about my my own talent at times. Just sort of how it needs to be prodded uh, like a zombie. <laughs> and talent too is is completely mysterious to us, right? I mean, why why are why are some people able to do things that the rest of us can't? Or where does it come from? Or if we don't use it, what happens to it? Or I mean, that's one of the reasons Nakota is so hacked off throughout this whole thing. It's like you're able to access this thing that it only works for you. Why does it only work for you? Why is it? Why isn't it about me? Why isn't it about anybody yeah. but you? Why do you have this and I don't? That's it's like an the awesome mystery of talent, right? Why should anybody have anything? Mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that's a great way to look at that. <laughs> um. I have to ask you guys: Were you freaked out by the mouse? Oh yeah, I can down the. Yeah, I was very freaked out by that. Yeah, just the description of the sort of like mutated. I could just sort of like, I could kind of feel the like the soft flesh of the of the, the mouse hands and the the face, just you know, mutated and twisted like that. <laughs> really that's the, yeah, that's the the part that I would if I had to do it differently, there would not be a mouse. Oh really? Yeah. That was very memorable. No, I know, but I would not like to do a mouse like that. So that is my one regret <laughs> that there's a mouse. In there. I would, would rather not. Oh, would it be a different animal or just a little? No animal. No, no, no animals. No. Insects are bad enough. I'm. I would have found another way. There's a. Um, the the book has been optioned many many times through the years by different people, and at one point. One of the writers working on a script was going to do a cat. Oh, no. Don't, 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 oh. please don't, don't do, don't do that. And no. Just, no. Yeah. I know, right? It's like, mm, yeah, no, 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 no. Put a person down there if you must, but not a cat, not a cat. I, yeah, it's it's one of those things where, like, you know, I can, um, I can kind of see the um, like throwing down another person, but not a cat. I can see her chucking like people and animals down there. I really can, but 
I, I think for me, it's like one of those things where like small animals, like mice, cats, and whatever, they have that ability to know that something's going wrong, but not the ability to process why. Right. And I, th- I think about it too much from like their perspective, and it just makes me really upset. Like, like my cat killed a mouse a few months ago, and. And I was just like, oh my god, the mouse must have been so scared. It didn't know what was happening. And my, and my husband was like, but it was in our house. And we <laughs> no, don't want to know that. Right. You're right, and he's wrong. <laughs> You're right. The house is our fun home. Yeah. yeah. I know. But, but no, I was, um, I was, I was very like, oh no, it must have been so scared. Yeah, I am. Oh no, it must have been so terrified. And my husband was like, but... We, we don't want those in our house. That's why we well, have no house. Yeah. <laughs> but it's like, that it doesn't, that doesn't mitigate the fear and, and, I know. and pain of the mouse. I mean, I, there's a lot of things I don't want in the house that I don't want to see them in pain, right? Right, right, yeah. I mean, no. I'm not a fan of Jehovah's Witnesses, but I'm not going to torture them if they get in the <laughs> house, right? No, no, yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't want mice in my house, but. I need a tiger for that. <laughs> So, <laughs> yeah, no, it was. No, uh, that, Chris, that's I'll... probably the one. That is the one thing that I would would do differently if I had to do it all. But people have asked me too uh, many times, "Will there ever be a sequel?" And I can't imagine what I or anyone could do. Yeah. What would you do? I mean, what would it? What could it possibly be about? Um. I don't know. I think it wraps up really well. I don't think there's a need for it to continue because, to me, it wrapped up. So yeah, I, can't, I I agree. I can't see what else, unless they are asking because they would really like to know what's going on in that hole. And again, mm-hmm. I I can't tell you that. I don't know. Right. Um, I should get curious now. You mentioned it. The um. How close has the cipher been to actually being adapted into a, a movie or a... It's been optioned many, many times. Mm-hmm. Never hired a director or um, how far is production back? It's some of the some of the process I was privy to and some I was not. Okay. So I don't know where I mean once the option period is over, once the rights revert. Right. I don't know. I mean Sometimes I'm closer to the process, but mostly not. I think I did a script once for that, but a lot of it, you're selling the rights, or you're you're selling the rights, but you're not necessarily involved in the process. Okay. But uh, you said that they, uh, did someone actually try to, uh, did someone ask you to actually work on the script? I would be be a little leery of that only because if someone is adapting it, then because I have other texts for my, I do performance events, immersive events, and adapting something else, I have an idea of how I want that thing to go. A couple years ago, I did a version of Dracula. The idea was people were coming to this basement to have dinner with him and you're you're going to your Jonathan Harker is showing up there to meet his new employer in this basement where there's like no food and, and once I had that concept I knew there were characters I was not gonna I didn't want any Van Helsing, no Van Helsing in there, so he was totally gone. So if Brown Stoker had around to see my version, he might not have agreed with it, right? Or said, well, right, yeah. you know, you're, you're cutting out like a third of the, uh, but that was my concept for it. So if someone had a concept for the cipher, maybe having my fingers in that pie is not the best way to go. Right. Would you, would you I mean, you really, um, are you sort of averse to, um, a movie version or, you know, some kind of adaptation we made that is pretty far from what your uh, vision of it is? If it was done really well, I mean, that's, you know, if it's a really good movie, 
I would like to see it just as much as anyone, right? To see yeah. what could be done with that. Yeah. You know, I would be I would be interested to see what another artist could make out of the story. But because if I was going to do it, I would, you know, I would do it in my own way. But right. I've already done it, so I don't need to do it again. Right. <laughs> it's one of the few books that has seen some claymation. Yeah. I, that, that, that translates really pretty well. I can see, yeah, I can see some really good stop motion <laughs> going on. Or especially with the skull, I mean, crawling around. Yeah, there's one. That's sort of like, gave me sort of like uh, visions of um, Beetlejuice, I think. Yeah. The sculpture's kind of like Twitter. itching around yeah. the floor. Yeah, he described like the wound in his head. Um, became a little play person mm -hmm. at one point. Right. 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 Or as a graphic novel. I would oh, yeah. That. I think it would be would really fantastic that. as a comic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah a graphic novel. That that's would, what kind of surprise that I, I think that would be really I know, cool. right? No, that would, be, that would be pretty sweet. I would love to see what someone... Yeah. Because you could make things happen in that format yeah. that you can't do any other way. Right. Yeah, and you can get some really great visuals with like a big two-page spread and all the details, like a big splash page. Oh, that would be so amazing. Wouldn't that be fun? I know. I would that love would. to see that. I would love to see that. I, mean, I could definitely see this as like Richard Linklater's first horror movie. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> no, for real. No, then, and even, I mean, even the detail of, you know, their the place that they live in that room in the hallway and we tend to when when we shot a trailer for the when the ebook came out we shot a trailer uh, a friend of mine who is a filmmaker and they actually shot it on film so that was kind of cool wow. but we went to um it's called the russell industrial center it's a big old cold um kind of grubby industrial building and we shot it there and some of the scenes we used the freight elevator and we used the, there was a moment no one ever believes this but it's true there was a moment where we needed to use the men's room and we went in she and I went in and written on the mirror who knows what in nail polish I don't know what it was written in something indelible it said you look scared <laughs> we, oh my god, that's terrifying. <laughs> what a thing to write on the mirror, too. I know, right? And, and it's like, well, that's really curious that we would see this now in this weird kind of disused man's room on this gray afternoon while we're trying to make this thing. Yeah, that was that was a little gift. That was life imitating art, I think. That was kind of fun afterwards. Yeah. Once was, it was over, it was just it was more fun. Very unexpected graffiti, too. You expect, you know, like, for a good time call, but you well, don't right. expect or, you look scared. Or fuck you, or just something normal. Something, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was a little, yeah. True story, though. It was there. We took pictures of it. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, I guess before, before we get out of the, um, I'm curious what you're reading now. Like, what your favorite stuff is? Oh, yeah. What am I reading right now? Or what, what are you really excited about? Mm, there's a writer, uh, her name is Maurice Meyer, whose work I really like a lot. She has a, a book that came out earlier this year called Rag, and I think she's fabulous. Um, it's M A R Y S E, Maurice Meyer. <laughs> Okay. She has a short fiction collection called Heartbreaker, and she's working on another book where a young man falls in love with a skeleton, and I love her voice, and I love her imagination, so she's the person I'm real most excited about right now. What are you reading that is, is exciting? Um, well, besides the cipher. <laughs> Hang on, I I just finished something. I gotta look up because I keep track. Well, my the last couple of books that I read that I, that I really loved was The Fisherman by John Lennon. Um, That's supposed to be really really good. I loved it. Yeah, it's uh, and uh, uh, Paul Tremblay's uh, latest. Uh, right. 
Well, actually, yeah. he, he lives just south here. We actually had him here in the restaurant <laughs> talking to him. Um, <laughs> that was, I love that book. It was so good. Yeah. Um, I actually, just for, for my for my other book group, which is a graphic novel slash comic book group, I just finished Exit Stage Left, the Snagglepuss Chronicles, which was darker and more depressing than I thought it would be. Okay. Um, and then uh, When I Arrived at the Castle by Emily Carroll, which was really great. I thought she does a lot of great horror, comic, graphic novel stuff. And I'm currently working my way through a short story collection by Gemma Amore called Cruel Works of Nature. Oh, and it's very cool. good. That yeah. cool. She's a regular writer for the No Sleep podcast. Mm. And uh, her stuff is always just really, really good. The, the ending always comes out of nowhere. And nine times out of ten, it's an absolute kick in the teeth. I mean, not in like a really good way. So. That's hard to do too, especially once you really know a little bit and they start waiting mm-hmm. for it. Yep. Yeah, it's hard to do. Yeah. Uh, Lindsay is also a writer for No Sleep podcast. Yeah, I've, I've had a few things featured on No Sleep as well. So. so, yeah, no, I know how hard that is, especially because the format for No Sleep is that, oh, we've got to have like a twist ending at the end. So that puts added pressure on you to be like, Oh yeah, you better come up with something really scary and shocking and original. Oh, and it better have like a twist at the end that comes out of right. nowhere. But it can't come too out of nowhere. Like the audience has to be able to not see it coming, but like But it right, it has to make sense it, when they do. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So that's it's be like, yeah, no, oh, God. Yeah, that's hard. It is hard. It's exhausting sometimes, but it's fun. It's great, yeah, it's it great fun to, and the podcast is run by some very wonderful people who I love. So it's great fun. It's a challenge. It's, yeah, yeah. I'm trying to think of what else I have read. Um, I got some cool things at StokerCon, but I haven't started yet. So I don't know if I love them or not, but. Yeah, well, you're gonna have to get up to Michigan sometime for the next. Is it is Stoke Town always in Michigan or is it? No, they last year I think they were in Long Beach. The year after that, or the year before that, they were in Providence. Next year, they'll be in Thank you. No problem. And then the year after that, I think they're in Denver. So, oh. further west. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it was it was great. It was um, a lot of of Rick McCammon was there, who I had not met before, and that was pretty cool. I bet. Yeah, but it was good. It was a it was a great event. To put this in. I've seen pictures yeah. of it. Okay. Uh, uh, Josh and then Mallon, I can put it on the back there. of your. Did you meet everybody there? there? Yeah. There. Um, yeah. Karen yeah. Warren was there, who also is another meerkat person. Okay. And yeah, it was no, it was a, it was a good slate of guests. Really good panels. I was so impressed with the panels because sometimes with that many moving parts and that many people who want to be on panels, it can be a real bear to put stuff together in a, you know, to have flow and to be timely. And there were things I would have loved to, to see. But I couldn't because I was you know, programmed right at the same time, but really good panels. So what are you working on? What's your current project? Projects. The thing that I'm working on now is a new, it's a kind of a hybrid of performance and a novel called Dark Factory. Yeah. I just started that. In fact, I have a Patreon for it now. If oh, cool. you search me out on Patreon, Dark Factory is there. And yeah. I'm really excited. It is something different for me. It's something I haven't tried before. It's an, an amalgam of the performance work that I do and my novel. So... I'm very excited to see what form it will ultimately take. <laughs> it's I, actually, be a I, listened, lot of fun. I listened to uh, your interview with Mike Davis uh, at a Lovecraft Easy podcast, and uh, you were just describing the what went into your uh, production of Dracula. Um, yeah. Just having having made a bunch of vegan food that uh, no one actually got to eat. Yes, it was a, we ate it afterwards. I mean, once all the people were oh, okay. on, we ate it. It was great. 
Yeah, but the, the, the person who made it is a chef and she loved the challenge. I said, it has to be something that will look, she made this vegan blood sausage that was so great, but it looked terrifying oh, on the that, plate. That so. sounds like the, the greatest oxymoron I've ever heard. I know, right? Perfect. Vegan blood vegan sausage. Blood I love that. <laughs> I love that that exists. Yeah, that was it was a lot of fun. And it's in those details. I mean, those are the things that make really make a story or make a book, any yeah. story, a film, whatever, a graphic novel. It's the details that make the world real. So right. I'm excited. This Dark Factory is set in a club, a dance club that has kind of customizable reality. It's kind of like one step be one step past virtual reality and so you can sort of customize things the way you want them but then if real reality starts responding to what is happening in the club then like what does that mean is that a good thing is it a bad thing is it going to stop do you even want it to stop so it's going to be a lot of fun to put together to see where it goes that's cool yeah. that sounds um, awesome are there any questions? Um, no, this was a, a great talk. And yeah. thank you for, for chatting with us. This was really awesome. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you. I don't know if you can, if you guys can hear my cat. I, I, I can hear. I can yeah, hear okay. yeah, <laughs> I recognize oh, that noise. Chop, chop. I mean, yeah. I'm doing something, but what is that to me? My bowl. Yeah. My bowl, she is out my bowl. His bowl's not empty, it's a lie, okay? There's food oh, no. in your bowl. He just doesn't want that food. He wants I'm, this. I'm familiar with that particular lie. Uh, every time I work from home, if I need to make a conference call or a attend a webinar or something, that is when my cat gets off the couch, comes over to harass me. My cat oh, has contributed to like, so many Why are you doing calls. that? Stop doing that thing. Okay, did you stop? Okay, good. I'm, that's all I wanted. I just wanted you to stop. That's all. <laughs> yep, so I'm very familiar with that. Well, thank you guys for having me. It was fun. Thank you very much yes. for, for taking the time. It was, it was great. Um, so, Dark Factory is, uh, what is the, the Dark name Factory. Of it? Oh, cool. Yeah. All right. All right. All right. Thanks, guys. Yeah, Thank you. Good night. Good night.